Consider Joseph Tainter's three modes of collapse. The runaway train, the dinosaur, the house of cards. The rise in population and pollution, the acceleration of technology, the concentration of wealth and power, all are runaway trains, and most are linked together. Population growth is slowing, but by 2050 there will still be three billion more on Earth. We may be able to feed that many in the short run, but we'll have to raise less meat, which takes 10 pounds of food to make one pound of food, and we'll have to spread that food around. What we can't do is keep consuming as we are, or polluting as we are. We could help countries such as India and China industrialize without repeating our mistakes. But instead, we exclude environmental standards from trade agreements. Like sex tourists with unlawful lusts, we do our dirtiest work among the poor. If civilization is to survive, it must live on the interest, not the capital, of nature. Ecological markers suggest that in the early 1960s, humans were using about 70% of nature's yearly output. By the early 1980s, we'd reached 100%. And in 1999, we were at 125%. Now, such numbers may be imprecise, but the trend is clear. They mark the road to bankruptcy. None of this should surprise us after reading the flight recorders in the wreckage of crashed civilizations. Our present behavior is typical of failed societies at the zenith of their greed and arrogance. This is the dinosaur factor, hostility to change from vested interests and inertia at all social levels. George Soros, the reformed currency speculator, calls the economic dinosaurs market fundamentalists. I am uneasy with this term because so few of them are true believers in free markets, preferring monopolies, cartels, and government contracts. But his point is well taken. The idea that the world must be run by the stock market is as mad as any other fundamentalist delusion, Islamic, Christian, or Marxist. In the case of Easter Island, the statue cult became a self-destructive mania, an ideological pathology. In the United States today, market extremism has bled with evangelical extremism to fight intelligent policy on messianic grounds. Mainstream Christianity is an altruistic faith, yet this offshoot is actively hostile to the public good, a kind of social Darwinism by people who hate Darwin. <laughs> President Reagan's Secretary of the Interior told Congress not to bother with the environment because, in his words, I don't know how many future generations we can count on until the Lord returns. George W. Bush surrounded himself with similar minds and pulled out of the Kyoto Accord on climate change. Adolf Hitler once gleefully exclaimed, what luck for the rulers that the people do not think. <laughs> but what can we do, what can we do when the rulers will not think? Civilizations often fall quite suddenly, the house of cards effect, because as they reach full demand on their ecologies, they become highly vulnerable to natural fluctuations. The most immediate danger posed by climate change is weather instability causing a series of crop failures in the world's bread baskets. Droughts, floods, fires, and hurricanes are rising in frequency and severity. The pollution surges caused by these and by wars add to the gyre of destruction. Alfred Crosby sardonically observed, Mother Nature always comes to the rescue of a society stricken with overpopulation, and her ministrations are never gentle. The case for reform that I've tried to make is not based on altruism, nor on saving nature for its own sake. I happen to believe these are moral imperatives, but such arguments cut against the grain of human desire. The most compelling reason for reforming our system is that the system is in no one's interest. It's a suicide machine. 
All of us have some dinosaur inertia within us. But I honestly don't know what the activist dinosaurs, the hard men and women of big oil and the far right, think they're doing. They have children and grandchildren who will need safe food and clean air and water and who may wish to enjoy healthy oceans and forests. Wealth can buy no refuge from pollution. Pesticides sprayed in China condense in Antarctic glaciers and Rocky Mountain tarns. And wealth is no shield from chaos, as the surprise on each haughty face that rolled from the guillotine made clear. There's a saying in Argentina that each night God cleans up the mess the Argentines make by day. This seems to be what our leaders are counting on. But it won't work. Things are moving so fast that inaction itself is one of the biggest mistakes. The 10,000 year experiment of the settled life will stand or fall by what we do and don't do now. The reform that's needed is not anti-capitalist, anti-American, or even very deep environmentalist. It is simply the transition from short-term to long-term thinking, from recklessness and excess to moderation and the precautionary principle. The great advantage we have, our best chance for avoiding the fate of past societies, is that we know about those past societies. We can see how and why they went wrong. Homo sapiens has the information to know itself for what it is. A species of ice age hunter only half evolved towards intelligence. Clever, but seldom wise. We are now at the stage when the Easter Islanders could still have halted the senseless cutting and carving, could have gathered the last tree's seeds to plant out of reach of the rats. We have the tools and the means to share resources, clean up pollution, dispense basic health care and birth control, to set economic limits in line with natural ones. If we don't do these things now, while we prosper, we will never be able to do them when times get hard. Our fate will twist out of our hands, and this new century will not grow very old before we enter an age of chaos and collapse that will dwarf all the dark ages in our past.